Welcome to the Sideline Live podcast. Subscribe for more episodes and follow our social media at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. Today I'm delighted to welcome Irish senior women's hockey player Naomi Carroll. Naomi has also played inter-county football and camogie for her native County Clare. We had a great chat about her sporting career, overcoming her ACL injury and the GPA's Jim Madden Leadership Programme. I hope you enjoy. Hi Naomi, thanks a million for coming on. No bother at all, thanks for having me. So what I like to do is I usually give the guests about 20 or 30 seconds to just give a bit of background on themselves in their sporting and professional life. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm from Crathlow. I'd have originally started playing with the boys when I was younger. I'd have started with my best friend, Maura McGrath. Uh, she, she's the reason I'm playing, really. And then from that, I'd gone on and started playing a bit of camogie and football. And it was from that then that I got into hockey with my club, Catholic Institute. So I've been playing there since I was about 13. And playing with the banner then would be my football club in Ennis and Six Mile Bridge be camogie. So I've been playing the three sports for the last number of years but at the minute I'm concentrating on the hockey I'm on the the, the squad for the moment that are um, preparing for the Olympics in Tokyo next year there's a squad of 33 of us and that's to be cut to 16 so a long way to go yet but it's good to be part of it. Very good and the second thing I like to do is what's called the sideline seven so it's kind of a fire round slash thought-provoking set of questions so you can take your time in it or you can go really quickly it's up to yourself. I am so the question First question would be, uh, what is your favourite quote? My favourite quote is, <laughs> uh, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. Yeah, that's a good one, all right. Yeah, it's one of favourites of mine as well. Um, what would be the best sporting event you've been to? That can be either in Ireland or abroad or one of each, depending on how many you've been to. Uh, best sporting event, All-Ireland Final of 2013. Uh, was, that the, was that the men? Oh, the men's. Yeah, that was a good match. Yeah. And biggest setback or challenge you've had so far in your career? Uh, tearing my cruise sheet in 2018. And we're going to get to that in a minute now um, at the end of the podcast. And what is your biggest achievement on or off the pitch? Or pitch or uh, pitches pitches in your in your uh, circumstances? Biggest achievement probably, I suppose, being from. Clare wouldn't be a big hockey county to have represented Ireland 100 times in hockey or over 100 times would be probably my biggest team. Mm. And then kind of reflecting back uh, on everything, what, would, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Uh, to back myself or to anyone who's at that age, back yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. So, And if you want to try something, give it a go and challenge yourself every day. And then in terms of a dream dinner guest, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Roger Feder, because he's incredibly ambitious, he's incredibly successful, but he's also had a lot of setbacks, so it shows that he can keep going even, even when he has these, how resilient he is. The last question would be, if your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? Uh, this chapter would be called Commitment, so committing to, I suppose, the Irish hockey team, and to every part of the training, like recovery and nutrition, training properly and kind of focusing on, on all aspects of it. And then kind of going back to your, your background, you spoke about how you began in sport. Did your parents play? Did your siblings play? Or was it just your friend? You said, you know, I'm just going to give this a go with her. Yeah, actually, no, my parents wouldn't have been sporty, nor would my brother and sister. And since actually my brother is now a marathon runner and he's quite oh, good okay. at it. So it's funny. Yeah, he had no interest at all. Uh, no, so it would have been it would have been the McGraths and Cratlow, Joe and Eileen McGrath, they'd be very well known in, in the GA world, would have started bringing me to training down with the boys. Mm. And that would have been the reason I'd have started. And then my mom, Margaret, would have been incredibly good to go to the matches. I'd say at the start, she was like, this poor Crather now doesn't even know what way to play. <laughs> but I'll go, I'll go and I'll clap. Um, so that would have been the reason I'd have started. But since then, now my mum would be very involved. She loves, especially the hockey, she'd be involved herself in Catholic Institute. Okay. And then growing up, you played a multitude of sports. What was your favourite or were they all just, I love them all equally or was it just, I'm doing this to keep fit in the winter or anything like that? 
Camogie would have been my number one. I obviously played hurling with the boys and loved that. And then I went and started playing with Napiershik with the girls as well. I was able to play kind of both at the same time. Mm. And I just found that there's so many different skills in Camogie that you can always be improving at some aspect of it. Mm. And as a forward, you can be learning to shoot from different angles and working on your defensive side as well. So I, I really always loved Camogie. Now, I, I love the other sports as well, but Camogie would have been my number one growing right. up. And obviously with camogie and hockey, was there much crossover? Did, like when the scales were camogie, did that help a lot with hockey or was it maybe a detriment with the different kind of hand positioning on the stick and stuff? Yeah, it helped me a lot because I'm left-handed as it is. So oh, with okay. hockey, yeah, you have to put your left hand on top and because I'm left-handed, that's how I play camogie. So oh, def- definitely crossover. And in terms of 3D, so getting the ball in the air in hockey would have come pr- a little bit more naturally just because of the camogie. Yeah, okay, okay, That's I didn't realise that. And then you played a bit of soccer growing up, is that is that right? Yeah, I played with Lifford in Ennis. And then you remember, I don't know if this is right or not, but you're, were you a member of the Ireland under-17 soccer team, is that is that correct? Yeah, just for a small period, and I played with the under-15s as well, so with the under-15 school team at the time. So you were playing soccer, hockey, camogie and Gaelic football all at the same time? Yeah, it was very busy for a while. Oh, oh my God. Oh my I was God. gone every night of the week. I was going to say, I'd say you didn't have a night off to yourself. And then no, you, played, you played a bit of camogie. You've, you've played camogie and Gaelic football at the intercounty level. And you, you played both at the same time. How did you sort of balance this? Like, there's always a debate of the dual player coming up. Was it, was it hard to balance it? Was there a lot of communication, you know, with both squads saying, you know, I'm here tonight? Or what, what was that kind of balance like? Yeah, I think communication in that in that regard is so important because as a player, you want to keep everybody happy. And if you haven't communicated in advance, you think I need to train 12 times a week and I can run from camogie training to football training, but you're actually just putting yourself in risk of injury. Mm-hmm. So to have spoken to your coaches and to make sure that there's a relationship between the two inter-county coaches themselves, that they understand they're not actual machines. Like they need, These are the days they're going to go to camogie. These are the days that they're going to go to football. Mm-hmm. And I think that those relationships now appear to be even better than they would have been in the past. And it wasn't that it wasn't there. It was just that the understanding wasn't actually there about player loading and about, I suppose, just keeping people fresh and making sure that they, they go into matches as as ready as they can be without being overloaded and without being at risk of yeah. getting injured. And in terms of then your schedule and trying to keep that load, what would your training schedule be like? Would there be something on every day? Would you get a rest day? How did you, how did you sort of manage that? Uh, at the minute or when I was younger? When you were, when you were playing the dual, the dual sports? Yeah, so I'd have always had one night off a week that I could have done whatever I wanted. But other than that, you'd have pretty much six days of going some of the trainings mightn't have been as high intensity as they as others but I suppose because of that relationship with the with the coaches and the understanding that was there I always knew coming into a game that I felt fresh and then obviously there is weeks when you're more tired than others but that can be because of work or because of other things as well Mm -hmm. but it's just making sure that you you can get that balance and one thing that I do I always do now I wouldn't have done it when I was younger but on a Sunday I'd write out my whole week so everything I know that I'm going to be doing whether that's meetings training recovery and I make sure that if on a Wednesday I'm going to do an hour of mobility or an hour of yoga I just make sure I get that in because it's something that I'd planned in the week so I think that's kind of helped me to stay fresh as well and is that something that you you still do at the moment that sort of yeah it's something so with um with the Jim Madden leadership program and I know you'd mentioned that uh with that I have a life skills coach and it's one thing that she discussed even at the start of lockdown you know that you you go from being so busy to actually Mm. having to be in a house all day for weeks months Mm. that she said make sure at this at your week plan the whole thing out like like you'd normally do when you're really busy so it's something that has always helped me and it continues to do so Mm, that's a brilliant tip for anyone not even in sport I think just in general just to balance obviously a lot of people working from home you can't really escape nearly because you're on your laptop but maybe in your kitchen and then you have to go try switch off at five o'clock which is probably so hard to do so that tip about scheduling could could be applicable to anyone 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I find it as well. I'm so, I'm like I said earlier, I, I try to please everybody. If some, so if someone asks me to do something, I'd always try and say yes. Mm-hmm. And if I don't have it written down, I could end up saying yes to four things at the same time on the same day. Mm-hmm. And then you have awkward con- conversations where you try and fix that and <laughs> you've already committed to something. Yeah. So by planning it, I can at least say, oh no, I'm actually busy at this time, but I'm free later in the day or I'm free a different day. So yeah. even with that, it's, it's saved a lot of conversation. Yeah, I'd say so. And then when you weren't playing football and camogie and soccer, did you were you involved in the underage Irish hockey teams? When I was about 14, I went, or 15 maybe, I went, um, there was a development day in Catholic Institute. So in the day, it was just, you played a bit of soccer, you did a small bit of running, you did some handball, you did jumping, and then you played a bit of hockey. And from that, it was talent ID. So they picked out a couple of players. And from that, they sent those players to Munster under 16 trials. Mm -hmm. And I'd have been lucky enough to have been selected. And from there, then I was involved in every underage Munster and Irish squad. So it was because of that talent ID really but I suppose because I didn't have a huge background in hockey the fact that I had the GAA um, background would have really stood to me okay yeah and then so you would have played up then all of the squads what would be your best moment of your underage career uh I remember we played against England in Cork uh, I think it was an under 18 competition and it would have been my first time beating England and it was in Cork which is a, obviously in Munster whereas most of the the big games would be in Dublin so it was pretty class to have kind of as close to home as you can get when you when you're talking about water bases in um Munster so it was mm. that was a really special occasion brilliant and I'm sure everyone from Clare had the banners out and everything <laughs> exactly yeah they were like we'll make that trip anyway <laughs> <laughs> brilliant and then you made your senior debut in 2012 is that correct yeah I did so I was we played in the under 21 tournament it was in Portugal and the Irish coach at the time had come over and watched and he picked a number of us from from that tournament and gave us a chance of training and then from that selected a couple of us to get our uh, our debuts mm. our first cap uh, a couple of weeks after uh, so you weren't too long waiting for your for your debut it was just a couple of weeks training and then you were kind of given the chance yeah I was pretty lucky that way it's the way just the timing that fell that uh, it was only maybe two weeks of training then I, I was lucky enough to get to get my first cap brilliant you were were you thrown in the deep end or were you prepared for it <laughs> I don't know how prepared you can be um, I was probably running around like a headless chicken but <laughs> it was good to play yeah. yeah brilliant and what was that moment like you know going out in the pitch for your first senior cap you know obviously all the work you put in underage all the squads you know how, what was that moment like for you Oh no, it was brilliant. And with my club, like Catholic Institute, they've always been incredibly good to me. And even like a t- during during my career, uh, at one stage I had to play in Dublin because at the time when you were playing on a, nas- on a national team, you had to be playing in the EYHL, which would be the top tournament. Oh, okay. And I did. I played for a season with Hermes in Dublin and we were really successful that season. We actually won the National League, which was brilliant. It was class. Oh, okay. But then, and I played with Cork Harlequins as well. But when now I'm back with Catholic Institute, and it's like my home team but they'd have supported me all the way along like there have always been that kind of good camaraderie between us brilliant yeah and that was probably obviously a big moment for them one of their own you know as you said there's maybe not that much hockey or in Clare and to get that senior debut I'd say was was massive for them yeah and with our club as well we'd had the likes of Emer Cregan who'd have been captain of Ireland so I'd always looked up to her and Elaine Bromwell so there were those people that you always kind of wanted to emulate and be like you know at the same time yeah and then uh 2018 you got your 100th senior uh, cap for Ireland against Spain uh what was that moment like you know obviously 100 caps it doesn't come along that often for players uh what was that moment like for you I was thrilled, yeah, it was class to get it, but then during the match I nearly broke my jaw. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we lost, so like, oh, right. great to get the 100 caps, but <laughs> I genuinely nearly broke my jaw to get an x-ray and everything, but I've oh obviously made a tough stuff from Claire, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. no, getting 100 caps was brilliant, and as I said, like, there's not a huge amount of people from Claire who are playing hockey, the numbers have risen in the last number of years, which is mm. which is great, but I suppose for myself personally and for my family, it would have been pretty special because starting off I would have it would have been something that I'd have seen very far down the line and very much 
achievable but achievable with a, a huge amount of hard work so I was mm. it was pretty cool so it was memorable not only for the 100 caps but for a lot of other reasons as well <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> and then later that year uh, it was the dream summer for Irish hockey and you were named as a non-traveling reserve what is what what is that sorry I don't know a lot about hockey so I feel terrible yeah so it's different so do you know in your in the GA if you have your match day squad of your twenty four who can talk and can play and then you have we'll say the six or seven who are still kind of part of the squad but aren't going to play on the same day who are yeah. picked and then you've named your two reserves um, depending on where the tournament is on so we'll say for the likes of New Zealand today they brought their reserves with them but because the tournament is only in London, we weren't over until um, the semi final. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of bittersweet, like you're a small bit of part of it, but at the same time, you were just outside the 18th. So yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when you arrived, then what was your role? Are you participating in training? Are you just waiting for someone in case someone gets injured? What What is the role of a reserve when they obviously when you've got over with the team? Yeah, it's just if there's an, an injury that you, you get called in. Okay, yeah, how it works. and it would be like that for most tournaments. Um, then we'll say with the Olympics, there'd be 16 players picked, and you'd have two reserves. So, oh, the 16, okay. if one of the 16 get injured during the turn tournament, one of the reserves can come in and play, but other than that, they, they don't play at all. Okay, um, so then during the World Cup, what was sort of the best moment for you off the pitch? Was it celebrating afterwards? Was it you know, watching the girls get their medals, you know, what was what was that moment? What was your favourite moment? Uh, my favourite moment would have been the homecoming in Dublin. There was, I think there was about 5,000 supporters there. So it would have been the biggest turnout I'd have ever seen for anything I was involved in. Mm. Uh, so it was class. Like, it was just unbelievable. And nobody would have even expected that, that amount of people to, to have shown up. Yeah. And in terms of then... Uh, your own club did you get to kind of have a big celebration down there as well or what were did they come up to Dublin what what was that what was the kind of celebrations like there yeah so Roisin Upton uh, one of the girls on the team she's from Catholic Institute as well and there was a, a big night they had a big night but on the same day I was supposed to have surgery for my <laughs> ACL oh right. so in Dublin ready to go for surgery and my surgery got cancelled so I ended up missing the night and oh, missing sugar. Oh, surgery on the day yes, it was a disaster bad timing and we're going to get to your injury in a second and just kind of looking looking to 2018 and to now you know how has the perception and the support for Irish hockey changed or has it changed it definitely has changed when there's something big on and I think people were brilliant to support and everybody in the summer of 2018 everybody was talking about hockey but a little bit less maybe in 2019 when the club matches would have started back. The the numbers that potentially could have been there probably weren't coming out to support. And obviously it's completely different to now people can't go to support at the minute. Mm. But it's when those opportunities are there, you would like to see the numbers starting to filter to filter through a small bit more. Mm-hmm. In terms of people playing, there is a big start. There's more people, there's more kids starting to play, mm. which is brilliant. And it's just so important that we keep them playing and keep encouraging them. And then obviously for the qualifier last year, the numbers would have upped again and the amount who were watching it and supporting it would have risen risen again but it's just important to try and keep that kind of consistent mm, and keep the momentum going and maybe try to transition it down to the club level not just the senior ladies absolutely yeah mm. and then just before we get to your injury what is your sort of pre-game routine are you listening to music what sort of music what you know how far out do you eat and you know what would be your sort of go-to meal before a match um, I normally eat about three hours before. It depends if it's an early match. I'd have something like eggs and toast, mm. maybe jam. And then if it's a later match, normally like a sandwich or a wrap or something. I try to eat kind of light three hours before, like my big meal, but it wouldn't be a huge pasta meal. I just don't oh, okay. personally like that. Mm. And then if I need to top up, I might have half a banana or something smaller, a little bit of yogurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in terms of routines before, I always wear a white headband when I'm playing. <laughs> I heard about this famous headband. Yeah, that's kind of my thing. I make sure I have that yeah. <laughs> in my bag. And uh, listening to music kind of varies. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends on the day. But the, the main things are trying to eat three hours before and my headband. <laughs> Very good. 
and then you tore your ACL in 2018 when was it were you playing you were playing football was it yeah I was playing football we were in the All-Ireland Intermediate Quarter Final against Meath and I had actually come on so I was only back playing football a couple of weeks Oh. and I got the ball on the right hand side of the pitch and went to sidestep someone and I just knew my knee popped out and popped back in oh. and I knew it didn't feel right I heard two pops yeah. and then the physio came on got back up physio kind of looked at it did the test thought it was fine and then I tried to play on it went for me again but it wasn't until about two weeks later that I actually uh, had my MRI to figure out what it was because the physios and doctors who looked at it because my legs would be strong ish mm. from hockey and from playing from, sport from all the training you're doing <laughs> exactly yeah everything around it was compensating for it so I was passing all the ACL tests kind of not a bother mm. and then it was uh, I went to my my a different physio then and he looked at it and he said I can't look inside your knee so the only way we can be 100% certain is getting an MRI so that's mm. actually really good advice that he gave to me if somebody is having a needle or there's something with your knee or a part of your ankle or a part of your body that you can't be 100% sure what it is, mm-hmm. get an MRI because even if it's perfect, at least you know yourself it's perfect and you're not kind of carrying with you, is there something that there could be there or there isn't? So when I got the result of that anyway, it was completely ruptured. Okay, right. And then in terms of, you know, hearing that diagnosis, what was the original thought and sort of what was the recovery time that was kind of given to you? Was it a, a full year? Or was it nine months? I think is a common time. Yeah, so I, it was two years. So it was in school, and we were only back. So we're just back now in school as well. But we were back. Uh, it was the first day back, and we had a meeting, or the second day. And I remember finding out after school, and there was a, an issue getting the. So obviously, it's your doctor who has to read the results and send them to you. So there was an issue between getting the results to my doctor. So I remember being like, "Come on!" <laughs> obviously, they have far more patients than one. Yeah. <laughs> And then I got a call after school and I went into one of the classrooms. I was so upset because I was thinking everything is possibly that could go wrong, you know, um, was going wrong. And one of the teachers came in to me and he actually did his a couple of years previous. And he was so good and he knew straight away before even asking, he knew what it, what I just heard. Mm. And he talked to me straight through it and like, told me you know there's more positives to come from this like it is negative but like it's mm. how you per- perceive it and it's how you go about it mm. so even from just talking to him straight away I realized come on get yourself together you're fine kind yeah, of exactly. thing yeah that's, worst thing happening. that's brilliant that you know you had someone to sort of help you along and I know you spoke to Podge Collins as well um a dual star with Claire what advice did he give you in terms of his own recovery and his own sort of injury process Yeah, he was brilliant. So as I said, the day I was supposed to have surgery, it actually got cancelled. So Mm. again, I was like, you know, the thing has gone wrong. This is brilliant. Mm. So I got back home and it was the next day I texted him and I told him and he said, look, come up to Craftlow Gym and I'll do, I'll go through a few of the prehab drills with me. So Mm. our prehab exercises and he was exceptionally good he Mm. showed me loads of exercises and again he talked about all the positives of having this time to do this prehab work and how it was going to benefit me on the other side because I was all mopey and saying Mm. another thing has gone wrong I think I won't you know I I won't bother I'll I'll take a break for myself and he was like get started today today is day one of your recovery so speaking to him was brilliant and even the fact that he was able to give me those exercises and I knew that he had been through the same thing himself so Mm. when you have someone you can trust in it's great mm. and he's from Cratlow as well which was nice and then obviously you know you have to keep your thoughts positive and you know to get to you know get through the recovery and, and get back playing did you ever have any doubts that you wouldn't maybe play not play again but play to the level that you know you want and you know you can play at I actually didn't and I think the reason that I didn't was I didn't put that in my mind until very close to the end so mm-hmm. As soon as I had surgery, my main aim was to try and get my legs straight, to try and put my socks on again. Like I kept breaking it down into really small goals. Mm. And I knew if I could keep achieving these really small goals each week, that eventually I'd get to my bigger goal. Mm. And I kept thinking, if I do these really small goals really well, I'll be actually better. I might be fitter. I might be faster Mm. rather than telling myself because... I suppose a lot of what you tell yourself is how you will react to something and the more negative thoughts that are in your mind, the more negatively that you'll kind of perceive something or see it, that Mm -hmm. the outcome will be. Mm. And then you kind of, you did, you started up a blog and you kept, you had those little goals in the blog because I was reading it 
uh, a good while ago and I loved it was like what I did this week what I'm going to do next week what kind of prompted you to start the blog was it to keep that motivation going to keep those goals taken over or was it for keeping others motivated yeah well I started it because I was so used to being accountable to people I played as you mentioned earlier I played a few sports and I was always in a couple of teams and I'd be accountable to be a training and to train hard and Nobody was going to see what this work that when you're injured, people do forget. Like they, at the start, everyone's brilliant and they're exceptionally good and they'd be talking, you know yourself. Mm. But then people do forget because they have their own lives. Yeah. And I had to think to myself, if, if I start to forget, then I'm not going to get better or get as, you know, as, uh, do as much during this time as I possibly can. Mm. So I thought if I keep myself accountable by actually posting this online, whether it's just myself who reads it or myself and my mom, it doesn't actually matter. <laughs> She'd always give it a good read. Yeah. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't actually matter to me. It was just the fact that I was accountable to myself. And each week then I, I, I'd kind of set myself the goals. Like sometimes a lot of them would come from physio, but then mm. some smaller things might come from myself. Mm. And it was just, okay, can I get to that in, in the week? And can I also, like, it gives you a chance as well to start doing things outside of sport. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking if I could link these in with my blog, like I got to go to India, um, oh, okay. for the which, was, which was incredible and something you don't get to do all the time, obviously. But then what I've noticed recently is because I have that and when, when you're injured, you can think of everything at the time. But if you asked me now, like when you were 12 weeks into your injury, how did you feel? Like I wouldn't know. But when I look back, I can see, do you know, Naomi, at 12 weeks, this is how you were. Like now you're two years post being injured. Like take every day or take every training session, train properly because you don't know when you're going to get injured or what's going to happen. And you can't think like that. You just have to kind of enjoy the process, enjoy everything you're doing. And then you mentioned before that you were you were asked to join back with the Clare Camogie ladies football squads when you did, when you were injured. How did this sort of help your recovery? It was it a lot of that accountability stuff again. Was it something to go to? I know I, I, I have a big injury myself and I'm, I was lost at the beginning because I was so used to, you know, I'm training uh, two, three days a week. Now I've nothing to do in the evening. I'll just, I don't know, watch a bit of Netflix or something. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I was the same. I was thinking, oh, I'm useless to everyone. <laughs> this is just really sad. Yeah. And the Claire Camogie coach, uh, Ger O'Connell, rang me. And I remember when he rang me and I was like, look, Ger, like, I think you're ringing the wrong person here. Like, I'm inclined to be useless to you. I haven't even had surgery at this point. He said, no, there's, you know, there's more important things than being on the pitch. Like, you'll have a really good influence in the background and we'll get you doing things as the season goes on. And I think it was about a week after surgery that I went to the first training session. And from then on, I, pro- I didn't miss a huge amount of trainings in the whole year, a huge amount of matches. I don't even know if I missed any, but mm-hmm. it was just that accountability to be there. But it was different from the training accountability because coming to training is fine, but you actually have to push yourself in that session. So mm-hmm. that was just getting me, making sure that I was meeting people in the week and doing anything that I could while I was there to help. As I mentioned, probably wasn't much. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was there anyway, but it was great because each week, like I said, when you're planning it, if I had nothing to put in other than work, it would have been a very long year. Whereas when you have these days, you know, might be two days, might be three days, it's keeping you ticking over and it's keeping you doing something and it's keeping up meeting your friends and seeing people on a regular basis. And I'm sure it was, I I, I would find, you know, let's say for if I had a teammate, you know, that had a big injury, you know, seeing them come down to all the training sessions, all the matches, you know, that would make me accountable and say, you know, Jesus, you know, Naomi's coming down to train and, you know, I need to be pushing myself because she would give anything, you know, to be in my position for even just a session. Like, I'm sure you would have given anything to just do a 30 minute training session about halfway through. Yeah, dead right. And the other thing we had was we have obviously had a rehab group and mm-hmm. Claire Command again, was brilliant. She was, she kind of nearly took charge of my recovery, we'll say, on the side of the pitch. And any sessions that she could make, she'd take me and she'd do an hour of a session. But a rehab group, obviously during the season, there's niggles and people will come in. And as I, I told them, they graduate from the rehab group. I, I'd welcome <laughs> them in and tell them off. <laughs> tell them to, but when, even when they're coming in, I was like, get yourself right <laughs> properly and then you can go play. Like, I was like, I'm going to be here for way longer. So, yeah. you know, make the most of the training sessions that you can have. So, it was nice and then eventually I could when I could start joining training 
even if it was just at the start doing the warm up or doing something really small I was like I will warm up the best that you will see a warm up <laughs> being done because you're in it for so long that's all you want to do you just want to be with everyone and do what everyone else is doing yeah oh it's 100 it's it's I find it like I remember it, I still struggle I've, I've been watching a good few matches now and it's like torture because you just you know in your in your mind that you that you're able to be out there in terms of like mentally and maybe tactically but like physically you're just not there and it just it's taxing like it's awful to be watching from the sideline and for such a long time as well like you know what your recovery was nine months to a year like that's so long to be on the sideline you know watching watching people train and play yeah it is and yeah it was nine months to the around nine months until post-surgery when I was playing so it is and like if you think about that at the start mm. it's nearly too daunting because you're thinking yeah. how am I going to get to then but just because as I said like writing down those little goals every week the week started going it went from one to seven to 15 do you know and I was like I'm the, the longer it goes the closer I'm getting back to playing mm. and then once I could start jogging I thought Jeannie I'm nearly there now even yeah. though you're on my lap <laughs> you're not nearly there <laughs> you're getting there you know your your sets are small and then yeah. when you can start turning you think now I'm starting to replicate what I do in a match and mm. the most interesting I think about even doing that like two years ago is people are still contacting me now who'd have been who'd be in a similar situation and who'd mm. find I don't know is it helpful or is it unhelpful but some people like I remember at the time about six weeks after I started it, someone contacted me and said, oh, like I read your blog. And I was like, oh, that's lovely. Thanks. And then they said, I, I only need to crutch this for two days. And sure, I needed them for two weeks. And I yeah. fully needed them for two weeks. I was like, oh, yeah, class. I'm glad I make you feel better. <laughs> Even if I was doing that in one other verse, and I, yeah. you know, I'm uh, happy out. Uh, no, it was brilliant. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't tear my ACL, but I found it helpful, you know, to see someone document you know the, not only the ups but the downs you know sometimes you know things don't go according to plan and you know I had a day where I didn't leave my bed and like you know that was the worst day but then the next day I got downstairs and that was huge and in terms of you were saying you know you got jogging you nearly take you know after a couple of days you know you're you're buzzing because you can jog again but then you're like okay when can I start sprinting when can I start going left and right yeah I fully agree with you in that because you're looking forward to running for so long mm. and then you do it and you do it a couple of times and then you think okay this is easy I need to, I need to go further yeah. <laughs> whereas you need to be your physio or whoever is guiding you in that you need to be doing this for a certain amount of time because I was the same I jogged about I remember when I got out of Santry after my was a five month or six month checkup or the first I can't remember which checkup it was but he told me you can start jogging now and I remember um even in the car park I started jogging to the car and if you <laughs> seen me you'd have thought oh my God, she doesn't look like she should be jogging but it was just the start of it I was like this is me now I'm nearly back <laughs> that's <laughs> you've got to tell yourself like that's hilarious that's brilliant <laughs> and then kind of uh in terms of you know looking back you kind of said to you know the other girls saying to the other girls you know savor your training because you don't know you know you don't you can't take it for granted you know because you could just have an injury anytime anywhere what would be what would you tell yourself you know maybe a couple of years before you did your ACL is it just savor the moments you know don't take you know don't take your ability for granted yeah it definitely would be and I think everybody there's a time in any season when you get really busy and the training is slog and you have to keep going and you're thinking oh I've trained in tonight at this time and you're nearly not looking forward to it whereas now I knew I'm not saying I look forward to every single training session mm. because I don't like there's not everyone but I think 90% of them I do and I try to take something good out of it and Mm. even small things like I do I wouldn't have done before but like at the end of each day I try and either just say to someone three things I'm grateful for in the day and it's mm. small but it kind of keeps you taking over and just missing a year of sport or however many months nine ten months and standing on the sidelines and going to every still putting in the driving that others were doing and standing mm. and still putting in the hours but in a completely different way it just made me to realize how much I enjoy it when I'm doing it and like warm up properly train properly and if you're supposed to be training hard train hard mm -hmm. if you're supposed to be doing tactics make sure you understand what's going on like all sides of it I think it, it has made me appreciate it more and then maybe in terms of as well when you're when you've had a big injury or when you're conscious of injuries you know 
um, you're not going out when you shouldn't be, you know, when you're not supposed to be sprinting, you don't sprint. You kind of, you know, to yourself, right, it's actually not worth 10 minutes of sprinting and I could set myself back two or three weeks. Yeah. And I remember at the seven months, once I passed seven months, I felt so good. I was able to do all training. And I remember saying to a man at the time, I said, I'm ready to go back. And she said, Naomi, you, you are ready physically, but each week after, I think it's seven months that you leave it, it reduces your chance 50% each time of redoing it. She said, if you go back now, you're going to have it in your head. And she kept giving me, like, she was like, I have more tasks and I have more things for you to do before I think you're, you're re- really ready to go. Even though, like you said, you feel like you're ready yourself and you want to go back in. But why risk it for the sake of waiting four or five weeks to you're fully ready to go, then going out? And even if you have it in your head, you have a higher risk of doing something if you're nervous about it. Whereas when you get that clearance, like I remember the day in Santry when I went up for my nine-month testing and my I got the clearance to actually play. When you have that confidence in your head, it means that you can go out mm-hmm. and have no doubt in your mind at all. And then in terms of returning to play and that confidence, did it take you a while to get it back? Or, you know, when you got that clearance from Sanctuary, was it, okay, grand, I'm, I'm going guns blazing 100%? Oh, in my head, it was 100%, but I'm ready. And I thought, yeah, I've passed this test now, I'm ready to go. But I remember at a camogie session, we were doing all the skills and all that was fine and touch and everything. Because I've been doing that for weeks and months anyway myself. But then we went into a match. One of my really good friends from Six Mile Bridge, Chloe Murray, we were playing just a match, but you had to stay in your zone. And any time the ball came in, I'd kind of turn like a bus instead of just turning normally <laughs> and practicing. Yeah. And I was really jittery about myself and I just wasn't myself at all. And we came over and we got water or something. And she just came over to me and said, are you all right? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, I'm fine. But like, I couldn't have been more on point than ever. Yeah. And then... I went, I just said to her, I said, Chloe, I just don't know if I can turn properly. So she just said, look, go back in. You're 100% fine. You've got this clearance, like go and train like you normally would. And from even from her saying that to me, I just went back in and I was able to play properly. Mm. But it was the thoughts in my head thinking, this is your first time being in contact. What if someone shoulders you? What if someone pushes you? What if you fall yourself? Like all of this going around in my head as opposed to just thinking, just play. Yeah. And then in terms of, you know, having the sort of injury concern do you ever worry about doing it again I know as females we are more likely to do it than than men and I think when you when you do your ACLs you are at quite a risk of doing it you know tearing it again is that something you kind of worry about or you just kind of say look I'm just going to go hell for leather and what happens happens no I'm not I'm actually not worried about it at all but what I am doing and what I so I ideally would love to have been playing football camogie everything at the minute because Mm. of lockdown and the hockey will say being delayed but after speaking with the management and because of obviously being injured in the past and other reasons I was told that I couldn't play and because I was told that I think that if I went and played something all I think in my head is you've been injured before you're going from playing on different types of surfaces and I'd I'd hate to be doing something that I had a doubt in myself about Mm. whereas when I'm going out playing hockey because I know that I'm something that I can focus on and that I'm 100% fine to do and I've done all the training on Astro, then I just back myself 100% and I know it's fine. I know I warm up properly like I should do and then I'll be fine. Yeah. And then in terms of the, the WGPA and the Jim Madden program, you spoke about it before briefly. What is, what is the program to kind of give a brief sort of background and explanation to it? Yeah, so the Jim Madden Leadership Programme, it's a programme offered to inter-county, play, inter-county players and also to ex-inter-county players. And in it, you do a development centres. So in a development centre, you do like a, one, a one-to-one a interview, you do a one-to-one role play, you do a presentation and you do an online task. So it shows you your areas that you're really strong in and your areas to focus on. And then you also get a, a life skills coach who have four or five meetings with during the year so it just helps if there's something you want to plan out or if there's anything you're worried about you can talk to your life skills coach about this Mm. so brilliant we do we have uh webinars kind of every couple of months and in them we hear from different people like we heard from the likes of Fergal O'Rourke who's the CEO of PW and last week Mm. um you hear from different hurlers footballers camogie players it's just brilliant to hear different people's points of view and different people's experience that they've had so it's fantastic and 
how long is the program? Is it over a year, number of years? How long is the sort of, uh, till you get your graduation, I think there is a graduation involved. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it runs for 12 months. And in it, normally, obviously this year with um, COVID-19, there's been more online than there normally would be. So normally you'd have more on-site days. Mm -hmm. So we'll still have a couple, hopefully face-to-face on-site days uh, coming towards the end of it. But in fairness to our instructors, they've kept the course running over the last number of months. Brilliant. Yeah. It obviously gives you something to do as well in terms of, you know, there hasn't been a lot of sport on, there hasn't been training to go to. It kind of keeps your mind possibly taken over. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been really, really interesting. And every week the content is different. And mm. even this week we're looking at conflict. And, you know, it's something that you mightn't be uh, used to seeing every single day, but it shows you how to deal with different types of conflict that you see and different types of management and leadership skills and styles. So it's it's brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Mm, it sounds fantastic. And what would be sort of the biggest things you've learned from it or sort of the biggest takeaways for you in terms of any anything, leadership, you know life sport what what would be sort of the biggest takeaways yeah so from the talk that we had the other day it would be just being completely upfront with people so I know myself I shy away from confrontation I don't like it at all yeah. and I'd be great to say no that's fine and then you know as I mentioned earlier commit to something that I can't do mm. so we've learned a lot about if there's something that you're not comfortable with doing or if that you have to have a hard conversation that you just need to make sure you have the right skills to go about it but that mm-hmm. you do make sure to, to stop it at the source rather than letting mm-hmm. something fester on for weeks and weeks mm-hmm. um, would be something that I'd really have picked up on it in, in the last few days. That's fantastic and then just as we finish up kind of looking back on your career so far what would be your best moment on the pitch or if you can't narrow it down we'll do a top three sort of moments uh for camogie i think winning the Munster senior final i think it was in 2012 we won it mm-hmm. with claire which would have been the first time i'm not sure in how long that but my first time definitely ever winning that and beating cork which is class for hockey obviously being involved there thereabouts with the world cup was just an incredible experience the whole lot of it and it's supposed to see the hype that that was there for it and everything that was unbelievable and then also winning the EYHL with hockey as well because it's you're winning the best league in Ireland so that would have been class oh and with football winning the Munster oh, yeah. final we won the Munster final with my club with the banner a couple of years ago I can't remember oh, what really? year yeah but it would have been the Munster A final which would have been savage to win and then in terms of off the pitch what would be the best moment you know would it, was it that homecoming in 2018 off the pitch moment yeah it would be the homecoming from 2018 because mm-hmm. it was just like years of hard work and showing how how much hockey has built up in Ireland and the support that's there for it and mm. just seeing everybody out there in front in front of us was class. Mm, fantastic and hopefully all going well make the squad and we'll hopefully have a big homecoming again next year after the Olympics. <laughs> Fingers hopefully <crossed>. thanks for that. <laughs> and then in terms of looking back again, we're doing a lot of reflection in this podcast. Uh, what, is, <laughs> <laughs> what is the biggest thing you've learned from your sporting career? Uh, the biggest thing I've learned, biggest thing, I think probably the biggest thing I've learned is uh, resiliency. So to show it in every side of your life. So if something doesn't go right in work, to bounce back in sport, bounce back. I keep fighting, don't give up. And back yourself. And then my final question would be, uh, in terms of all of the sports and all of the teams you, you've played on, what would, what would be your advice to players, maybe in a similar situation, on time management and sort of balancing multiple sports? What would your advice uh, be to sort of those types of people that are balancing to, you know, elite level sports at the same time? Well, I think, first of all, if it's something that you really love doing, then in any way that it possibly can continue to do it make sure that you speak to both managements and try to take yourself out of it like if the management speak together then it saves conversations for you every week and it means that you can just go and do what you enjoy doing and playing and there's no you don't have to get stressed or bogged down about missing a training session it's all planned and as I said I do I just try to plan everything from the start of the week on a Sunday know what I'm doing Monday to the next Sunday and then it leads to far less stress than, than trying to just fit everything that you possibly can in. 
Mm-hmm. So it's definitely that scheduling on the Sunday night, you know, write everything down, make sure you're not double booked and kind of give yourself that, those recovery days properly as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important as well. And I find just to make time either for your friends or for your family or for your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever it is that you don't have to have it scheduled, but that there is either a free block for them and you're not trying to squeeze them in between work and training that there you do have some quality time that you can spend with them or if you're it's, it's your animals like my dog charlie <laughs> just <laughs> whatever it is that you do have time for yourself as well because mm. at the end of the day you do need that downtime that's absolutely fantastic advice and look thanks so many for coming on i really appreciate it um definitely check out naomi's blog uh, naomi acl recovery dot blogspot.com i think is the right one and your instagram naomi caro 13 as well so naomi thanks a million for coming on i really really appreciate it thanks a million orla and sure i'll be talking to you soon again thank you thanks a a big thank you to naomi for coming on today if you are listening on apple Podcasts and you did enjoy the episode make sure to leave a rating and a review as it does help the podcast to grow If you are looking at setting up your own podcast, be sure to get in touch with the Primal Productions team over on Instagram at Primal Pro. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.